right, so we're, uh, we're here. We're going to start gaining momentum in the positive direction. We've seen the problem and, and started to see what operability means, and it's a little bit overwhelming, but as you start understanding your problem more and seeing applications of what you're learning, things are going to start coming together. It's quite appropriate that I'm going to be talking about reliability again today because last night at midnight my computer died, crashed. I couldn't turn the power off and, it, and the thing didn't run so it just sat there with, its, uh, with the fan on all night long. So fortunately Professor Dunn had the material here for us so we didn't lose the class. We had uh, <clears throat> talked about series, we're, we're, we talked about some definitions in, in reliability, and then we talked about series systems. And we saw them in series systems, the more components we had in series, the lower the reliability, which kind of makes sense. So if we have 10 things in series and they all have to work to make the plant function properly, then the reliability is going to be poorer than if you only had two systems in series. We have plants that have hundreds of things that have to run, or thousands of things that have to run uh, successfully to, uh, to have a successful operation of a plant. And this was sort of discovered, not discovered, but recognized in World War II when people started to build very, very complicated machinery. Rockets, I think the, the bomber uh, that delivered the bomb in Hiroshima had something like a million components. It was built by, I think it was built by Ford, and their auto, previous automobiles had a few thousand components, and all of a sudden they had to build something that had a million components, and almost all of them had to work at the same time so that you could get from the little island to Japan and back. And now we have much more complicated systems, so it's, it's well recognized. Um, now let's talk about parallel systems. So now we have several systems in parallel, and the system functions if at least one path is functioning. At least one path is functioning, not all of them. So both of them could be functioning properly, or what, the top one could fail, or the bottom one could fail. That's OK. But if they both fail, then the system fails. So what do you think about the reliability of that system? If I had two in parallel, would that be better than having one? How many think yes? You are right. You are absolutely right. So, and we're going to apply this in many of our designs. So as an engineer, you'd say, show me the equation. Right, so, so I'm not going to derive it, but I'll give you a hint. So you have to start with this equation. So if you start with the probability of failure of the parallel system is equal to the product of the probability of failures of the two systems in parallel, or if there are three, the product of three, and so forth. So if you start with that equation, you'll easily derive this equation. And for n systems in series, or sorry, in parallel, we're going to have this equation. One minus the product of one minus ri. If all of the uh, ri's are the same. Okay, so we can, here's a little graph. Here's a little graph of the failure probability of the elements and then the system reliability. For only one system, the green is 2, the red is 3, the blue is 4. What do you notice about that graph? Let's think about the graph now. First of all, is the green line better than the than the, with the triangles, is it better than, I guess it's a purple line with the X's? Yeah, 
for sure. So as we add more and more parallel paths, uh, the system performance gets better. What about the amount of improvement between the purple and the green, and then the green and the red? Which one is bigger? Purple and green. Okay, so we got the first parallel path got us. You got to be Shaquille O'Neal to. Okay, so uh, there's a big improvement here, a much smaller improvement here, and an even smaller improvement there. Now, since each parallel path is a whole new piece of equipment, one would expect the cost of each one of those parallel paths to be the same, right? So if I had two reactors in parallel or three reactors, each one of the, and you're experts in cost now. You really know that stuff. So you're going to have to buy all the same equipment over and over again. So the cost to go from here to here is the same as the cost going from here to here and from the red to the blue. So the first one gets us a big improvement in reliability. The next one gets us even less. The next one gets us even less. So we would conclude from that that there's probably an optimal number of stages in parallel. Because at some point, you're going to spend a lot of money and get such a small improvement in performance that it's not going to be worth the money. Okay? You see that? Everybody see that? So each one of these costs the same, but we're getting a lesser and lesser improvement in operation, so we're saving less and less money with each one of those stages. And a little bit later on, we're going to look at an example and see that that is really true. OK, what about examples of parallel equipment? <clears throat> so everything you've done so far in fluid mechanics and heat transfer, you, you, you're talking about one piece of equipment. But there are places where we have two pieces of equipment in parallel and maybe even three pieces of equipment in parallel. Okay. Now, qualitatively, what would we put in parallel? Things that, yes? Okay, so I have, have poor reliability. That's right. And another aspect of it, it would be yeah, critical to the process, absolutely, sure. I wasn't even thinking of that one. So three, which is, I should have thought of it. That's a good one. Thank you. What's the third one? Think about money. Things that cost less. Okay, things that tend to fail and things that cost less. So we're going to see things that don't cost so much. And in engineering terms, things that don't cost so much are like $50,000. Sounds like a lot of money. But things that cost less, if we had a $10 million reactor, we're probably not going to put that in parallel by another reactor. So here's a couple of examples. Parallel pumps. So this is, remember when we looked at the reliability data, we said machines that move and turn and, and go at high speeds, they tend to have lower reliability. Also, pumps are cheap. So we quite often will have parallel pumps. How many parallel pumps should we have? Well, we'll talk about that. We're going to look at the economics. Also, sensors. You know, the person who's absolutely sure of the time is the person that has one watch. Right? I just look at my watch and say, that's the time exactly. But if my watch fails, I don't know what to do. So where, we need, where there are critical variables that we really need to understand and know and monitor, maybe to prevent accidents, we're going to put in parallel sensors. So you're going to see as you start designing your plant, and when you get out and work around uh, in, in industry, you're going to see a lot of equipment. You say, boy, that, why did they spend all the money? Think about reliability. Think about reliability. There's always going to be some project manager who's going to say, what? Why do we need two sensors? A couple thousand dollars more for that sensor and a wall of wiring. Get it out. But 
the cost of the failure, because when this sensor fails, we have to shut the plant down, is a, is a lot of money. So it's worth the investment in many places. Okay, so with critical variables, quite often we're going to use multiple sensors. Now, in the chapter, I'm not going to go over these, <coughs> there are some other systems, other common design structures, I should say, common design structures that you know, are used in electrical and mechanical and chemical engineering. Here's a bridge system. So if I had two plants over here, let's say I had plant A and I had plant B sitting right next to one another, and there were lots of units in those plants, it's quite common to put a bridge connection between the two. So if I have a failure in part of plant A, I can take some of this material out of A and put it through B until I can fix A. If I have a failure in, in B, I can take some of the material and put it over in A. So these bridge, in chemical engineering, they're sometimes called crossovers or jump overs. So if I had two parallel plants, I would put some crossovers, and that would enable me to continue to run part of the plant that has the problem by diverting the, the material into the, the second plant. Okay, so that's quite common. <coughs> The other is a, uh, the second one is a standby. Now, when we talked about parallel, when I showed you the parallel, the mathematics behind them were that they were all running at the same time. So if there were three elements in parallel, all three would be running. Now, you, if you say, well, I've got two pumps, and I really only need one, but when one fails, I want the other one to start up. Then we could use, we don't have to use waste energy by running the two pumps at very low efficiencies. We could have a standby. So R1 is, is the normal path, and if this fails, the switch automatically starts R2. So what, yes? Absolutely, yeah. As long as it's, it's in the overall plant and the plant is in operation, right? Mm -hmm. Everything like that, yep. Uh, and so, so if, if these were two pumps in parallel, how would, what would I, I need something to measure to decide that I should start up pump two. What could I measure that, that I could use then as a sensor to go to a little computer and say, oh, I think pump one has failed, I'm going to start pump two. What variable would I measure? Okay, where? Yeah, exactly. So the pressure here. So if the pressure falls, the pump's not doing its job. Now I could do things like I could look at the power to the pump, or I could look at the, whether the, the shaft is moving, but the pressure is the most comprehensive. It, the, the shaft could be, could be turning, but it could have been broken between the motor and the pump. So the, shaft's, the motor's moving the shaft, but it isn't turning the pump. So there's lots of things we can measure. We try, and you made good, a very good choice. The pressure tells us the effect of all, all, all kinds of different types of root cause failures. Okay, so we can have a standby system. And that means we, we don't have to have all of those in parallel running at the same time and wearing out as well. Okay. Now if you do have a standby system, quite often at some point you're going to switch these. Now, you may run this for six months with this standby and then you'll switch the two so that you get kind of even wear. The other thing is, well if it's been sitting there for 10 years and then it finally fails, what's the likelihood that this pump sitting there for 10 years never running is actually working? Maybe pretty low. Okay. So you tend to switch them. All right, so the other, one, the other one down here is K of N systems. That's a voting system. So let's say I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a, a reactor temperature that I'm measuring, and if it gets too high, I have to shut the reactor down. Very common, exothermic reactions. So how many sensors will I put there on that reactor? We said probably at least two. Why not three? Let's put three there. So that's even more reliable. 
If that temperature goes up, one of those temperature sensors is going to see it. But the problem is, and you could put four or five, you could put lots of them in there. If one of those temperature sensors fail, then you shut the reactor down as well, when you shouldn't, right? Because now our, my sensors are also part of the reliability equation. So if I have three, that's really good for safety and shutting the reactor down, but then I shut it down too often because when any one of these sensors fails, I will shut the reactor down, even though the reactor was fine. So what can I do? I can use a two out of three system. Two sensors have, two or three, but two sensors at least have to tell me that the temperature's high before I shut the plant down. So that gives me very good reliability in shutting it down when it's unsafe. It also gives me very good reliability of keeping it up when it's safe. So we see a lot of voting systems, K of N. So this could be two out of three or two out of four, whatever it happens to be. So there's, there's mathematics behind that. Uh, we're not going to go into that in great detail. But when you get out of practice, you're going to see those kind of shutdown systems, and you may have to include them in your design at some point. So if you have a system that's going to shut some part of the plant down, you have to think about whether it should be one sensor, two sensors, or a K out of N system. All right, so those are, so those are in the chapter, and I know you're dying to read the chapter. You're going to run right out of here and say, let's get that PDF file. All right, we need it. We desperately need an exercise. So let's do an exercise. <clears throat> Here's three different systems. You can think of these as pumps or whatever you, whatever you want. Here's a system of, that's purely series. Here's a system that's split. We have two series, but those whole series systems are in parallel. And here we've got what we call modular uh, redundancy. At each one of the modules, we've got a parallel path. Now, the system will run successfully if any path, whatever it happens to be, there's, there's a, a functioning element in any path. So what I want you, and each element is, I just chose a number arbitrarily, its reliability was 0.9. What you need to do is to calculate the reliability of each of these three systems using the equations that you already have for purely parallel and purely series. So the trick behind this is you've got to find parallel or series subsystems, calculate that reliability, and then group that, and then move on. Okay? Everybody see that? Okay, take a couple minutes, work on this one, and then we'll, we'll share our answers. If you have questions, raise your hand. Hands. Okay, you can work in groups. You've got to talk. The noise should go up. How do we do this? Again, if you have questions, we're here to serve.
Okay, who's got the answer for part A? Everybody have the answer for part A? A, yeah. What's the answer for part A? Somebody. The hardest thing to get is a volunteer. Yes? Okay, all right, good. Oop. So that's the parallel system. Okay, move on to part B. We'll do part B now. That's a very low reliability. Guys already here. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Everybody get how did how did you do that? Um, I set the chance of success, I guess, so the one minus one seventy nine for each top layer. Okay, so so you said that this whole thing up here, you said that's just a series system. Yeah. So that's got a reliability of 0.729. Down here is just a parallel series system again, so that's 0.729. Now I have a parallel system with each path 0.729. Okay. All right, take a few minutes and work on path C. All right, what's the procedure in C? How would we go about solving C? We don't. We just say we got two out of three. That's great. Yeah. Formulate the probability of failure for the, uh, each independent parallel system. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a parallel system here. So I can, and I know the elements. I know the reliability of each of these elements. So I can collapse that into a single unit using the parallel equation. Then I do that for all three of these, and now I've got a series system. And so, much higher reliability. So we can build reliability into a structure, a plant structure, um, taking so the simple series system is very low up to 0.97, which is still a little bit low for chemical plants. Okay, so we go from system level redundancy, we have like two parallel plants, if you will, you think of it that way, to module, modular level redundancy. Now, <clears throat> as chemical engineers, you probably will not make a lot of these types of calculations, actually do the calculations, unless you become a, a specialist in reliability, and there are such people, and there's all kinds of fancy software and stuff like that. Uh, to do that and to track how many hours each pump is running and all kinds of things like that. But the concepts are extremely important that we're learning here. Right? So the calculations are less important than the concepts to make sure that we include these concepts when we're, we're developing our chemical plant designs. Okay, but it's cost us money. So we have to have a balance we end up having to do an economic analysis of these systems. What's the right design? So we have to balance the cost of the investment versus the improvement in reliability, the fewer plant shutdowns, the less damage to equipment and so forth. Uh, and uh, we'll see a couple of examples of that. Okay, so, so this is sort of the generic reliability stuff that gives us the basis for our designs. So now we're going to talk about what we do in chemical plants specifically. So first of all, these are a whole bunch of good practices which would say make sure you specify your equipment correctly. 
and you match the equipment to the process conditions. You don't put a valve with some rubber, flexible rubber, touching the fluid if the fluid is uh, 700 degrees Celsius. I mean, it's going to melt. So, obvious things. You operate after breaking and before worn out and so forth. Now, there are three examples in the book, and I'm going to talk about one of them because it's really a nice, a nice one. You're, you just graduated, and, and your boss says, tell me the horsepower that I need for this pump. So you go, okay, so back to the thermodynamics book, and you say, all right, well, I know the pressure drop and the flow and the density, so I can calculate the horsepower. And then you say, oh, gee, this is the first one I'm ever going to do. So what would be the tendency? What might you do after you've done that calculation? And there's going to be an efficiency, and you're not quite sure what the efficiency is. So let's say it's a, it's a 300 horsepower pump. What might you tell your boss? You want to be on the safe side. So if the pump's too small, you can't get the flow through. If the pump's too big, that's OK, because all you have to do is close the valve a little bit more. So your tendency is going to say 400 horsepower. It's not my money. You know, so. And that's not a good idea. And here's why. You've you got to be very careful when you size equipment. And this is a great picture that is in no textbook. This guy, Behringer, is a consultant. And he has a lot of stuff on the internet and uh, got permission to use this. Here's the, the pressure head and the flow for a pump. And if you remember, this is the standard sort of pump curve you get for a centrifugal pump. At very low flows, you get a very high pressure drop. Uh, pressure rise, and, and as you get out, you get lower and lower until it stonewalls out here somewhere, and you don't get any more, you can't flow, th you, you don't get any advantage. Okay? So, you can be anywhere on this curve just by closing the valve, right? So, I can be anywhere on that curve just by closing the valve. So, where would I be on this curve if uh, I oversized the pump. If my pump was really too big for the application. You know, so then I had to close the so I but I could get a low flow a lower flow by just closing the valve. Where would I be on this curve? So the pump is sized for maybe a thousand units of flow, but I only need five hundred, so I'd be over here. And what does it say over here? Low flow cavitation, low bearing life, low impeller life. All of those bad things happen. So you, if you made the pump too big, nobody would notice for a while. But instead of having a four or five year life, your pump would have a one year life, and then it would fail. Then the boss would come around and say, well, what happened? So if you oversize the pump, they have low reliability. They have low life. If you undersize the pump and you're operating over here, same thing is going to happen. So sizing equipment is very important, not only to make sure it kind of works at the base case the first day when it's running, but to make sure that it's going to stay running for its expected lifetime. Right. So if it's operating near its maximum efficiency, that's also its maximum reliability. Okay. Nobody tells you that. And that's just as important as maximum efficiency. Over here and over here, you're going to waste a little energy, but nobody's ever going to notice if you make a design mistake over here or over here because of the energy. They won't notice. You'll pay for it, your company will pay for it. But if you make a mistake over there, then what's going to happen is your pump is going to fail too often. So is there a general conclusion? Yeah. There's no safe side in equipment sizing. You size it right, and you don't just deliberately oversize it. So there's some design books even that say, oh, throw in an extra 30%. <coughs> oh, you know, it's only money. 
Go ahead. No, because of these kinds of issues, your equipment will have low reliability. So, people who work with pumps a lot of times say this. Pumps don't die, engineers kill them. If you design it wrong, it's going to die. It's going to die young. In its teens, it's going to die. Right? So we have to make sure that we understand each piece of equipment and how we size it, and then we do that right. Now, <clears throat> Professor Dunst talked about operating windows. So you have to make sure that you can move around in that operating window. The pump's big enough to accommodate any expected flow changes that you're going to see in the plant, for sure. But then you don't throw in that extra 30% because, gosh, I'll look silly if the pump's too small. That's going to cost you a lot of money. Not just in energy, but in uh, reliability as well. And that could be more than the energy loss. OK? OK, so that's just that's kind of a little sermon, but a, a really compelling example. Of, and there's a couple other examples in the, in the book. I'll tell you that the one on the water treating example in the book, which is really interesting, happened at the McMaster Boiler House. I don't write that in the book because it was a mistake, but you can look at that one and see, see how they made a mistake and damaged a couple of vessels. OK, let's move on to the second thing that we can do. If equipment fails, we want to make sure that we can, well, we'd like to be able to fix it without shutting the entire plant down. So again, we're going to look at equipment that tends to fail more frequently. And we're going to put something in the plant to say, I can take this little piece out and still run the plant. And then repair it and put it back, either repair it or replace it. OK, so here's two parallel pumps. And I'm going to give you an infinite number of valves. What will, where will you put those valves so that you can repair either one of those pumps and keep the plant running? So if one pump fails, we want to be able to take it out of service, repair it, maybe even replace it with a new pump, and put it back in service. But we only need one of them. OK? Talk to your friends real quickly and sketch it out on the paper. OK, let me give you a solution. I'm going to take two of these manual valves. I'm going to put one here and one here. So I can shut off the intake to each one of those pumps. How's that? Is that going to work? If I have two valves, I put one here and one here, and then I take this pump out, then the fluid's going to come back around this way and gush out and spray everybody. That's not good. So just valves here is not enough. Where else do I need valves? On the outlet. OK. So I have to isolate the equipment completely. I have to isolate the e equipment completely. Now I put in some check valves, because they would normally be there. Check valves are just one-way valves. You can think of it as a little doorway in the valve, the simplest kind. So if the flow is going to go this way, it just pushes the door open. And if the flow tries to go back the other way, there's a little stop in the, and, and, and the door shuts, and it doesn't let the flow go back the other way. Now they're not, they're not, this check valve is not reliable in stopping all flow, but it'll slow it down a lot. And what, what you're trying to prevent with these check valves is a big, if you think of it as a water hammer, a liquid hammer of a, like if you're pumping something uphill and the pump stops and all, you don't want all this liquid to come gushing back down with a lot of momentum and damage your equipment. So this is a, a 
a one-way valve, but we need these isolation valves to make sure that we can shut it down completely. Okay, let's look at the second case, valves. Okay, so we think of a valve as, you know, it's like a faucet. Only in, in this case, the stem is going up and down and up and down and up and down. So what happens is you're going you're gonna to get wear. So it's quite likely that the valve will start to leak. And we see a leak in this valve and we want to correct it. But we want to keep the plant running. So I'm going to give you those valves and I'm even going to give you some piping this time. Okay? Very generous of me. So you got some piping and those valves. Make, make, give us a design so that you can um, replace that control valve. Replace the control valve. It's leaking. If we can't replace it, man, we've got to shut the whole plant down. We've got to write an email to the regional sales manager and say, sorry, you can't sell anything. Because one valve leaked. That's not good. OK, what do we do? What about the piping? What are we going to do with the piping? Okay, so we're going to have a bypass around here, right? So we need a bypass, and then, but we need some valves. Because if we just had the bypass, and I took this valve out, so everything's squirting all over the place. Some would go through the bypass. Most of it would be spraying all over your workers. That wouldn't be good. So where do we put the valves? So it's going to be before the valve and after the bypass. Yeah. So we're going to have two isolation valves, and we're going to have one bypass valve. Now normally, what would we say? What position would that bypass valve be in? Closed, right? So normally it's going to be closed. And these two isolation valves would be open, and we'd be happy. The Merrill, that's going to maybe happen. That's the way it's going to run for five or six years. Now the valve's starting to leak a little bit. We close off these two isolation valves, and at the same time, we're opening this manual valve. So somebody's got to be out there standing in the rain, opening the valve, and then somebody's in the control rooms on the radio saying, open it a little bit more. We need a little bit more flow. So you'd have manual control for the short time that you take this valve out and either repl probably replace it and then take it back to the shop and repair it. Okay? So we can get that out, replace it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to take too long in this case because that means that somebody's going to be out there in the rain and the snow manipulating this valve to get the right flow rate all the time. And that's something that Engineers will make the junior engineer do once. So you may be out there. Okay. Ah, heat exchangers. So heat exchangers can foul, they, and we have to take them out for cleaning. They also, if they're subject to vibration, there can be leaks in heat exchangers, and we may have to take them out completely, pull the shell out, and, and do some repair. Maybe block off some of the tubes that are leaking. So let's, let's there's cooling water on this side, and there's process fluid on this side, and we've got some valves here again, and you'll get some more piping, as much piping as you want. Okay, take a minute and look at this one. Yes. Would it really be 
be okay to bypass a keyless changer and still operate your process? Oh, that's a good question. We'll talk about that. That's, that's good. Okay, we have an objection here. Wait a minute. Can you take the heat exchanger out and still run the process? That depends. Typically, if you have like a, a bunch of heat exchangers in series, then you're going to have to take up more heat with those other heat exchangers. Right? So, so you have to account for that in your design. You're going to have to make sure that, let's say we've got some heat exchangers, and these heat exchangers are going to fall every three or four months. We know that from the corrosion chemistry. So we're going to have to make sure that we put in enough area and enough heat exchangers so we can take one of them out at a time and, and still keep the process running. If we don't do that, so that's the idea of keep making sure the operating window, you can stay in the operating window. If we, don't, if we fail to do that, then we're either going to have to reduce production rate, maybe we can get away with that, or then still we're going to have to shut it down. Right? So we have to think, the, the answer is we've got to think ahead of time and make sure that we can stay in the, op the de desired operating window. Okay. So where are the valves? Where are the valves going to be on this one? So we're going to bypass the process fluid, and we're going to have isolation valves here, and we're going to have a bypass valve. Right. Now the cooling water would just block off because it already has uh, essentially a bypass valve. Uh, it's a big cooling water system, so you just have to block that off. Now the other thing that uh, I wish we were to had a project in the boiler house, how, how, sort of how big are heat exchangers? How long is a typical process heat exchanger? The tubes come in sort of standard lengths. It's around 12 or 15 meters. That's a big thing, right? So if I want to get the tubes out of this heat exchanger and I build it right up against a wall, I'm sunk. I can't. So I'm going to have to make sure that there's space to, pu to pull that heat exchanger out. So when you go into the boiler house, you see a whole bunch of heat exchangers, and then there's this huge open area. It looks as though you, know, you could have a dance in there. Why did they waste all the, the, the money building, making the building bigger? It's because they have to pull these huge heat exchangers out the tubes out of the shell when they clean them every once in a while. They needed that space. So make sure, just remember, you need space as well as doing the stuff we're doing here. Okay, so lesson learned. There are going to be a lot more valves and a lot more equipment when we do things, when we put things, uh, make sure that we can isolate and repair equipment. Make sure you don't design plants that are so compact that the human being can't get in there to uh, do, the, do the maintenance. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. It's good, but... All right, let's do this next exercise on parallel. I've got two pumps here. Pumps need a source of power. How can I improve the reliability? So I've already got parallel pumps. That's good. But the pumps need something to drive them. So how could I improve the reliability of the system by, when I, when, with the drivers? In addition, this handles if the pumps fail. What about reliability of the drivers? So what did we talk about one really serious common cause failure? It was electricity. So if we lost power and we still needed that pump, we could use a steam drive. We could use a steam drive. So there are different things besides electricity that give us power. So we could have high pressure steam going through this turbine and drive this pump and an electric motor driving this pump. So in addition to having parallel on the pump side, we could have parallel on the driver side. Okay? And let's look at another example, even a simpler example of that same concept. Uh, here's a drum, and almost every drum is a potential problem. It's a closed vessel. Uh, operating at a certain pressure, and we can't go above that pressure. And if we fill it up, 
with liquid, it'll start going above that pressure. So we really want to control levels. And we can't see inside these darn things. I wish we had glass equipment. Then we could just look, walk by and see it. So we, we're going to put some sensors in. So we've had redundant sensors, so they're duplicate sensors here for reliability. So we've got two sensors. That's good. How could we choose those sensors so that we get even better reliability than just what we're calculating with these parallel sensors? How could we try to make a special effort so there's no common cause failure between the two sensors? No common cause error for those two sensors. How would we do that? Very common, okay? So, what we're going to do, and it's actually kind of sketched here, what do you think the physical principle behind this sensor is? By the sketch. It's a float. So it floats on the top of the liquid, and then we measure the position of that, the stem that comes out of the float. Okay, what do you think the, f the principle is behind this sensor? It's measuring something at two points in the level, in the drum, the top and the bottom of the drum. Yes? Okay, a switch, a switch could be used. It would look more like this, okay? It would use that principle. So basically there'd be something that is that thing came up it would throw the switch okay but these are two continuous sensors so pressure change in pressure right back in first year physics high school physics so if the liquids in here somewhere the difference in pressure between those two points tells tells us where the level is so what we have is we have not only redundancy but we have diversity and this is a very common procedure in chemical engineering where we deal with messy environments. So we have a sensor float and we have a de delta pressure. So we not only have the two sensors, but we have the two sensors with different root cause failures. And that's almost always done in levels. And it's done in other areas where we can. Not, we don't use diversity and temperature sensing so much. So the, the reliability of this would actually be better than we would calculate using our reliability equations because we've eliminated some of the root cause failures that would make both of these reliable. Okay, so we make things repairable. Here's where we put in diversity to really improve the, uh, the parallel structures. Oh, I'm going to skip the steam system. Um, let's, go to, oh, let's go to this one. Very common again. We want to stay in the operating window, especially if damage occurs when we're outside of that window. We've got to keep ourselves in the window. Here's, an, here's a compressor. You did that in thermodynamics and you did all the calculations and you have no idea how it works. But you did those thermodynamic calculations. So now we have to know somewhere how it works. And you looked at this head versus flow rate curve. And there was some strange surge line, if you ever saw that. What that surge line is, is if you get to the left of the surge line, in about two seconds, your machine self-destructs. If you're to the right, you're OK. What happens is, is it becomes an unstable flow regime, and the flow oscillates forward and backward, and it tears the blades off of the, uh, the compressor. So over here is OK. Over here is bad. So what are, what are you going to do? What do we need? Here's, here's, the, here's the basic 3G4 or 3G3, whatever it is, uh, flow sheet. What do we have to add to this to make sure we don't get into that red zone? That's like the terminal career area. Right? You don't want to get in there. Yes? Absolutely. We need a recycle. So we have to have an automatic recycle. We can't say, oh, 
if the alarm goes on, somebody walk over there and turn the valve, it's too late. So we measure the flow going in here, and we recycle. Now, since it's, it's higher pressure, we may have a little bit of liquid. So if we do, we have a little drum to make sure we don't have any liquid. Because you, you, know, you think of what would happen if you put water through a fan. That would vibrate the fan all over the place. And so we have a recycle here. So that flow rate has to be, the minimum flow rate has to be set to keep us out of this red region. So as we can see from all this stuff, <clears throat> we have to understand how each piece of equipment and each sensor works. We can't just say, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, I want a level sensor. Which one? Oh, I want the seat exchanger. How is it going to fail? So this is well known. This is well known. And, and, and you'll, so, so when you go out and practice engineering, make sure <clears throat> you not only use your textbooks and your equations, but you go out and look at the equipment and you talk to experts on each piece of equipment. Okay. All right. Well, I promised you the economics, but I didn't get to it. I don't know. Maybe Professor Dunn will do it. Okay. So uh, very important. Every plant has a lot of extra equipment, and if you didn't think about reliability, you'd say, well, why is all that stuff there? Why do we pay for all that stuff? But it, it, in the long run, you have to have it. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, just on behalf of the class, just to say thanks for the past ah. two guest lectures. Uh, <laughs> what really is pre <laughs> it's, a it's a tip. I got a tip. I never got a tip before. Okay. Uh, but uh, just your insights on the past two classes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.